A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankar Ice Academy. Today we are going to analyze the newspaper edition dated 17th of May 2022. These are the articles I have taken. Unfortunately, today we will be discussing many science and technology related topics. We will be seeing about fortification, geotagging, endosulfan, assistive technology. And before that, we will be discussing a previous year question from 2019 prelims paper. And at the end of articles discussion, I also have a practice question session. where i have given a quiz question for today so pay attention to the discussions so that you can answer the quiz question correctly so let us start the discussion with the previous question so today i have taken this question from 2019 prelims paper the question is about forest cover particularly talks about the percentage of the forest cover to the total area of the state see whenever we talk about forest cover or tree cover the answer to such a question lies in the state of the forest report what is this state of the forest report it is an indian report that is released by the indian ministry of environment forest and climate change particularly it is prepared by the forest survey of india which is again an organization of the ministry of environment now this state of the forest report is a biennial publication that is it is released every 2 years so the first report was released in the year 1987 and the recent report was the 17th report it was released in 2021 now this report provides definitions for uh, major environment and forest related terms and it also includes definition for forest cover according to the report forest cover includes all lands that are more than 1 hectare in area and which have a canopy density more than 10 percentage so remember the definition there might be a direct question based on this definition itself now also this forest cover does not make in distinction between the origin of tree crops or tree species that is there is no classification whether such a forest cover is man made or natural therefore the definition includes all types of land irrespective of their ownership land use and legal status and thus all tree species along with bamboo fruit bearing trees coconut palm trees orchids all are included in the definition of forest cover now before seeing the forest cover of states as i said the question i took was from 2019 prelims examination but the 2019 state of the forest report was released after the exam only in december so when you see this question you will think that you have to take the data from 2017 report so let us see the data based on 2017 report and let us try to arrive at the correct answer now as per the 2017 report the largest forest cover was in madhya pradesh this is largest forest cover total forest cover okay then after that comes arunachal pradesh chatisgarh odisha and maharashtra so these are the top 5 states that have the largest forest cover but the question asks for the percentage of the forest cover to the total area of the state so this is a separate data from that of the total forest cover here i have given you the data based on 2017 report as you can see here the northeastern states are at the top for example if you take mizoram the state has a forest cover of 86 percentage this means it's 86 percentage of geographical area has forest cover so on those lines we have arunachal manipur meghalaya nagaland etc so based on this data now if you look at the question here four states are given chatisgarh madhya pradesh maharashtra and odisha and these are the percentage of forest cover to the total geographical area of that state so from this list you can say that the least is in maharashtra and the most is in chatisgarh now the question asks for ascending order that means you have to start from the least and you have to end it with the most so first should be maharashtra then madhya pradesh then odisha then chatisgarh so this is the correct order that is 3 2 4 1 and the 3 2 4 1 is in option c now you may ask whether this data changed in 2019 report and then in 2021 report actually the answer is no because even if you take the 2019 and 2021 report there also maharashtra has the largest forest cover and the top 5 states and the other top 4 states are arunachal pradesh chatisgarh odisha and maharashtra so these remain the same and in case of percentage of forest cover to geographical area also the data remains the same there is only a meager change of percentages but still the order is the same so the least is in maharashtra then comes madhya pradesh then odisha and then chatisgarh there might be a change in the order after some 20 30 years but i don't think that in the immediate future there's going to be any change in this order so remember that the top 5 states 
with highest forest cover are Madhya Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Odisha and Maharashtra. And among them, Madhya Pradesh has the largest. And now when we talk about the percentage of forest covered geographical area, there northeastern states are the top. And among these states, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Chhattisgarh is the order. So even though Madhya Pradesh has the largest forest cover, its forest cover to its total geographical area is comparatively less. So always try to read the question carefully and then answer the question. So that is all about this question. Now let us get to the articles discussion session. So I have taken this news article for our first discussion. It talks about the fortified rice. See the news is that activists have raised concerns about the fortified rice that is being distributed as part of government schemes. So they have suggested the government to stop the distribution especially the distribution to tribal populations. Now, the reason stated by the activists is that this fortified rice is aggravating the health disorders among these tribal population. So, to understand what is the disadvantage with the fortified rice, first let us see what do we mean by a fortified rice, then its advantages and certain schemes under which government provides this fortified rice. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See here, the fortified rice means the rice has been subjected to fortification. So what is fortification? It is the process of deliberately increasing the content of essential micronutrients in a food. So micronutrients are deliberately increased in a fortification process. Now this is done to improve the nutritional quality of food and it is also done to provide public health benefit with minimal risk to health. But why do we need fortification? It is because the micronutrients are important. So what are these micronutrients? These are the vitamins and minerals that are needed by the body in very small amounts. That is their need is at a micro level. So such micronutrients include iron, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin B9, zinc and iodine. These are all micronutrients. Now these micronutrients perform a range of functions in our body like it enables the body to produce enzymes, to produce hormones and other substances which are needed for our normal growth and development. So that means even though the need of micronutrients is very small, still their impact on a body's health are critical. Particularly the deficiency in any one of them can cause severe and even life-threatening conditions. For example, if there is a lack of iron and a lack of certain vitamins like vitamin B9, vitamin B12, vitamin A, it can all lead to anemia. And we know that anemia is a severe health risk. It affects children as well as women, especially the pregnant women. Here also take note that vitamin B9 is also known as folate. So sometimes you may see lack of folate leads to anemia. And then if you take iodine, a severe iodine deficiency can lead to brain damage and particularly it causes a range of issues during pregnancy. It causes stillbirth, spontaneous abortion and it even leads to congenital anomalies in the baby. So that is why we say micronutrients are important for us. But the issue with micronutrients is most of them are not produced in our body. So they must be derived from the diet. That means we have to consume products that have these micronutrients. For example, if you see this infograph which is provided by World Health Organization, you have to consume these products to prevent iron deficiency. These are very easily available products. On the other hand, it also suggests you to eat more citrus fruits. At the same time, you should avoid coffee and tea during your meal so that you can absorb iron from the food. So like this, many foods have crucial micronutrients in them. So one way is consuming these products. Now another way is fortification of food products like pulses and cereals. And this is what is done in the case of rice fortification. That is here, rice is fortified. So how it is fortified and what are the essential nutrients which are deliberately increased here? See, various technologies are available to add micronutrients to regular rice. Such as these technologies include coating, dusting and extrusion. If you take extrusion, it involves production of fortified rice kernels from a mixture. And this is done using an extrudent machine. For example, if you see in this image, you can see the extrusion process. First, rice is broken down into rice flour and then that flour is mixed with micronutrients premix. And through the extrusion machine, this flour mix is made into fortified rice kernels. And then these kernels are added to the regular rice or blended with the regular rice to produce fortified rice. 
and particularly know that this extrusion is considered to be the best technology in india for rice fortification so now which are all these schemes under which government distributes such fortified rice it is distributed under the public distribution system under pm poshan scheme then also under integrated child development services scheme so now let us see the overall benefits or advantages of fortified rice first and foremost is it helps in eliminating malnutrition and nutritional deficiencies yes this is true because we are getting micronutrients like iron folic acid vitamins from these fortified products secondly the fortification provides extra nutrition at affordable cost plus it also should be acknowledged that fortification is a safe method of improving nutrition among people see the addition of micronutrients to food does not pose a health risk to people unless the norms are not followed for example in our country fssai that is uh, food safety and standards authority of india has given the norms as per these norms 1 kg of fortified rice should contain iron folic acid and vitamin b12 in these percentage for example there should be 28 uh, mg to 42 mg of iron then 75 to 125 microgram of folic acid and then 0.75 to 1.25 microgram of vitamin b12 they should be present in 1 kg of fortified rice in these amounts in addition to this rice may also be fortified with micronutrients other than these and they could be produced with a single micronutrient or in a combination of micronutrients but the limits given in this table should not exceed so that means a fortified rice must have a maximum of 10 mg to 15 mg of zinc only not more than that so just because you are fortifying rice only with zinc you should not increase this percentage so if these norms are followed carefully then it becomes a safe method of improving nutrition among people other than that the major advantage is fortification of rice is a socio culturally acceptable way see it does not require any changes in the food habits and patterns of people it is a socio culturally acceptable way to deliver nutrients to people particularly in case of india we know that we have very high levels of malnutrition among women and children we see anemia in women and stunting in children these are almost common in our country along with this rice is one of the staple foods of our country which is consumed by about 2/3 of the population and that is why fortification of rice with micronutrients is the best option to supplement the diet of the poor and thereby eliminating the malnutrition and finally fortification of rice is the cost effective method see apart from improving the nutritional status of populations fortification also comes with high economic benefits why because the overall costs of fortification are extremely low only like the investment then purchase of equipment etc so these low costs result in affordability of the product so all these are the advantages of fortified rice but along with this there are also certain disadvantages of rice fortification first disadvantage is it has low coverage that is only a handful of nutrients are added in the process of fortification hence other nutritional deficiencies remain untreated in this process so for example if the rice is fortified with iron that means they are leaving out other micronutrients that are essential for the body so this is one disadvantage the second one is the fortified rice fails to reach the poorest segments of the society see these poorest segments are the ones who suffer from micronutrient deficiencies and malnutrition but they do not get these this is mainly because they have low purchasing power and the government distribution channel is also weak and third and most importantly fortified rice could lead to nutritional overdose this is what is mentioned in the news article also see how does a nutritional overdose occur we just now saw that we have fssai norms that need to be followed for any fortification process and we saw the fortification process for rice we saw the percentage of micronutrients that need to be added so when this is done in order to help in identification such a fortified rice should be packed in uh, jute bags and there should be a logo plus f and there should also be a line stating fortified with iron folic acid and vitamin b12 so these should be mentioned to know that that rice is a fortified rice above all this the consent of the beneficiaries is also required that is do they really need this kind of fortified rice through government schemes or not has to be known first 
This is essential because, as the news mentions, in Jharkhand, many beneficiaries are patients who are diagnosed with thalassemia, sickle cell disease, and tuberculosis. As you know, thalassemia and sickle cell anemia are the conditions where there is already excess iron in the body. And in the case of uh, tuberculosis patients, they are unable to absorb the iron. So, what happens is when these people consume iron fortified foods, it leads to an iron overload and it creates adverse health issues like it reduces their immunity and functionality of organs so here there is a nutritional overdose so these are the major issues with rice fortification now to address these issues three things should be prioritized first it should be understood that the right to be informed of choices about one's food is a basic right that is, people should not be just dumped with uh, fortified rice through PDS system because they may not need fortified rice at all, like in the case of Jharkhand. So, they should be provided with both fortified and also a normal rice so that they can choose from them. And for this, they need to be informed of the choices. And second, it should also be understood that the right to know what one is consuming is a basic right, which means if in a school, if in a midday meal scheme, fortified rice is provided, then the parents of those children should be told that they are providing fortified rice. And if in that particular population, fortified rice is not required, for example, iron fortified rice is not required in case of Jharkhand, then they can directly tell the management that iron fortification of rice is not required in this area. And third, it should also be kept in mind that there is a need for precision because excess nutrient intake will only do harm. So the conclusion is universal fortification is not the answer for nutritional deficiencies. So if there is a question where you have to argue about, you know, universal fortification, you can go against that argument because you have this news article which states that fortification is becoming a problem. So what should be done is a targeted distribution of fortified products like fortified rice should be done. It should only be provided to the people who are in dire need of it. And for this, the National Family Health Survey data can be used by the government and only in those areas where there is a need for such micronutrients, it should be provided. So rather than dumping, a targeted distribution is needed. And people should also be made aware that there is a need for a diverse and quality diet to eradicate nutritional deficiencies rather than just consuming fortified products. So these are the few points that you have to know about fortification, particularly fortification of rice. Today we saw what do you mean by fortification, what is micronutrients, why do we need them, then the advantages in fortification, then the disadvantages in rice fortification. Finally, we also saw what needs to be kept in mind to attain the desired results. So with these facts in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. Now let us take up this news article for discussion. It talks about geotagging. Let us first see what is the news. The news is about the Silver Line project of Kerala. As you know, Silver Line project is also called as the K-Rail project. It is a proposed high-speed rail line in Kerala. And this project has been opposed by many. Now, to bypass the community resistance and political obstacles to the project, the Kerala government has proposed a new step. This step is the use of GPS-based geotagging survey. So before this, concrete markers were used on the private land to demarcate the proposed project. But this created a tussle between the people and the government. So now the government has proposed to use GPS devices to affix geographic coordinates of a proposed railway track on a digital map instead of planting the disputable markers on private land. So the Kerala government is taking a smart measure here. Now to have a clear picture of this move, you need to understand about geotagging. What is it? See, it is a term that is used to describe tagging a geographical location. It is a process of adding geographical identification like latitude and longitude to various media such as photo or video. So this geotagging help users to find a variety of location specific information from a device. It provides users the location of the content of a given picture. So this geotagging is the process of ascertaining the geographical location of an image. Now there is also another term associated with geotagging. It is geomapping. This geomapping is a visual representation of the geographical location of a geotagged asset that is layered on top of a map or a satellite imagery. 
So geomapping uses the geotagged assets. Now what are the major benefits of geotagging? Firstly, it improves the efficiency of government projects. See, the government officials who are associated with the implementation of welfare initiatives believe that geotagging has gone a long way in improving their effectiveness and coherence. For example, an initiative was taken to geotag all the assets that were built under MG Narega scheme and then putting the data in public domain. So this has established greater transparency of the scheme. But earlier, that is before geotagging, it was felt that the assets created under the MG Narega scheme like ponds and dams were neither durable nor always fulfilling a need. We know that there were many instances where a pond was dug up several times or a road was relayed more than once. This happened because there was no way of monitoring the assets on a real-time basis. But later, with the help of geotagging technology, the junior engineers were asked to geotag the completed assets and then photograph it. So this greatly increased the transparency and efficiency in implementing this scheme. So based on that, geotagging is being used in a range of government schemes like Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, Grameen, Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana and it is even used for toilet construction under Swachh Bharat as well as it is used for highways and urban housing etc. For example, if you take the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, pictures of each stage in the scheme like from the existing house to the proposed site of the new one and the progress at each step of construction all these have to be uploaded on a government portal. So through geotagging, the efficiency of these schemes are uh, improving and it is also improving the accountability of the government. But there is also an issue here because the erratic internet connections and lack of knowledge on the ground are certain big hurdles in implementing the geotagging feature. So this is how geotagging is used by the government. Other than that, there are also some day-to-day -day use of geotagging. For example, a geotagging is a popular feature on several social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. As we saw, geotagging is a way for people to highlight information about their location. So for example, someone might include a geotag when they are posting a status update on Facebook. So through this, they are letting people know where they are. Or sometimes a photographer can also add a tag to a picture to indicate the location of where that photograph was taken. So for example, if I'm sharing pictures while I'm on vacation and I'm tagging the location of the hotel where I'm staying at and also other the places of interest which I'm visiting, then it will give other people a better sense of what I'm experiencing. So based on that, they can plan their vacation also. Similarly, Instagram also uses a map feature which allows users to geotag photos. So in this way, geotagging is advantageous. But there are also certain disadvantages with geotagging. Mainly, it leads to an invasion of privacy. So just now I said that if I'm going on a vacation, I can share where I'm going or where I'm staying or what are the places I'm visiting. So that means I'm sharing you the private details and through that people can find out the locations where I like to frequently visit and this can pose an issue. Assume that if there is a stalker, then that stalker will visit that same location. So this is the issue with geotagging. And particularly giving out live information about uh, someone's whereabouts, it's like, you know, broadcasting to the burglars that you are not at home. So it becomes an opportunity for those burglars to rob you. So because of these reasons, security professionals urge the everyday users to be, you know, aware of adding too much locational data in their profiles in Facebook and Instagram because criminals can easily use this data to conduct several crimes including cyber attacks etc so what you can do is if you are even going on a vacation you can share those location etc after you come from there do not instantly share where you are every time be aware of the risks so these are few points that you need to know about geotagging especially about the risks associated with it so now let us take up the next news article Okay, now let us take up this news article. This is also another article important from a science and technology perspective. See, according to the news, the Supreme Court has criticized the Kerala government by saying that it has not done anything for endosulfon pesticide exposure victims. And this has amounted to a breach of Supreme Court's 2017 judgment. See, in 2017 judgment, Supreme Court ordered Kerala government to pay 5 lakh rupees each to the victims of endosulfon pesticide exposure in three months. There were a total of uh, 3,704 victims. 
But in the five years after the judgment, only eight of these victims have been paid the compensation. And that is why the Supreme Court has now condemned the Kerala government of breaching its judgment. So from exam perspective, let us know certain facts about endosulfan and why it is harmful. And we'll also see the Kerala issue in detail. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. So first let us see what is endosulfan. So it is a restricted use pesticide or insecticide. It is a pesticide or insecticide which is particularly effective against aphids, fruit worms, beetles, leaf hoppers, moth larvae and white flies. And it is effective on a wide variety of crops. So this pesticide or insecticide is predominantly used in temperate, uh, subtropic and tropic climate zones. But it is not approved for residential use. Also know that endosulfan is sold as a mixture of two different forms of the same chemical. It is sold as alpha endosulfan and beta endosulfan. And if we see some of its characteristics, it is a cream to brown colored solid. It is sometimes crystalline or in flakes. And it also has a distinct odor which is similar to turpentine. So that means endosulfan is a pesticide like any other pesticide. But there is a problem with endosulfan. And this problem exists due to the properties of endosulfan. So let us see these properties now. First is endosulfan can be released into air, water and soil. Especially in those areas where it is applied as a pesticide. Now this releasing into air, water and soil is an issue because endosulfan is moderately persistent in water. See persistent means it will continue to exist for a longer period. So it exists in water for a longer time. Particularly its main metabolite which is endosulfan sulfate is furthermore stable and equally toxic. And this endosulfan sulfate along with soil endosulfan, these both are highly persistent substances. But we saw that water endosulfan is moderately persistent. And here this endosulfan sulfate also has a higher half-life. See this half-life is a chemistry term. See it refers to the time taken for the half of the material to decay or to transform into other substance. So that means if there is a harmful material and if its half-life is also more, then the dangers of that material increases. So what about endosulfan sulfate? Its half-life is 120 days. So it takes 120 days to even decay half of the endosulfan endosulfate. So that means its dangers also increase. We'll see what are the dangers later. Now the second important property is endosulfan is highly bioaccumulative. See bioaccumulative means there is a gradual accumulation of certain chemical into the living tissue of an organism from the environment. So a chemical is accumulated in the living tissue and this endosulfan is accumulated. In addition to this, due to this bioaccumulative process, endosulfan is also expected to biomagnify. See biomagnify or biomagnification is another important term which refers to the bioaccumulation which happens through the ingestion of prey items. That is, here you are not ingesting that chemical directly, rather the food you eat has those chemicals and through that you are also exposed. And such an exposure is very toxic to all organisms. So what are the risks of such exposure? First, if you take the environmental risks, exposure to endosulfan could result in both acute and chronic risks in terrestrial and aquatic organisms. Why? Because for example, if a water is contaminated with endosulfan and a small fish has bioaccumulated that endosulfan. Now, if that small fish is consumed by a larger fish, then biomagnification happens here. So through this, the terrestrial and aquatic organisms get affected. And such an exposure results in both the reproductive and development defects in non-target animals, particularly birds, fish and mammals. It also affects human beings because we can also be exposed to endosulfan through food intake. Other than that, humans can be exposed by breathing contaminated air or drinking contaminated water or even by touching uh, fruits or plants that have been sprayed with endosulfan. So because of this, farm workers where endosulfan is used are expected to be exposed to higher amounts of endosulfan compared to the general population. So in humans, what are all the problems that may occur due to endosulfan? It affects the central nervous system, blood, which results in irritability, renal failure, etc. And even high level of exposure in humans may even result in death. There are also other effects like neurotoxicity, late sexual maturity, physical deformities, poisoning, deformities in newborns, etc. 
and another problem is these effects may be delayed so it may not be known immediately whether you have been affected by endosulfan or not so these are the risks that comes from being exposed to endosulfan so what happened in kerala see in kerala and in certain other states aerial spraying of endosulfan on cashew plantations was happening for over 20 years so we can say that this is a long period of time to be exposed to endosulfan so this has caused many mental and physical disorders in the region studies even established linkages between aerial spraying of the pesticide and growing health disorders in kasargo district of kerala it was found that disorders of central nervous system are very common among the children of the area uh, which includes cerebral palsy retardation of mental or physical growth epilepsy congenital anomalies etc there are also too many cases of cancer of liver and blood there were uh, infertility among men it also led to miscarriages and hormonal irregularities among women there were also skin disorders and even asthma prevailed in the region so these were all the health effects the people of kerala and certain other districts so these were all the harmful effects which the kerala and other state people experienced due to the use of endosulfan So because of this India finally agreed to a global consensus to ban endosulfan at the Stockholm Convention. So as you know the Stockholm Convention was signed in 2001 and it is a global treaty to protect human health and environment from persistent organic pollutants that is POPs. Now in the 5th Conference of Parties of this Stockholm Convention which happened in Geneva in 2011 India agreed to a consensus on a ban of endosulfan even though india agreed to this still it asked for exemptions to continue for using the pesticide inside india for at least 5 years so has india totally banned endosulfan actually no india had been resisting the ban on certain grounds it says that there is no sufficient scientific evidence to prove that endosulfan as a pesticide is hazardous actually environmentalists and activists say india is taking this ground mainly because india is the largest producer of endosulfan and also the largest consumer of endosulfan in the world and because of this only india is resisting the ban of endosulfan but if you take other countries they have already banned the pesticide or they are facing out it and in india only two states have banned endosulfan it includes kerala and karnataka because in kerala we saw that the kasaragod district was affected and in case of karnataka the dakshin kannada districts were affected now since the indian government was not taking any measures finally supreme court took cognizance of the matter in 2011 At that time Supreme Court passed an ad interim order to ban the manufacture sale and use of endosulfan throughout our country and this has to be done with an immediate effect and along with this a compensation was also to be provided to the victims which we saw in the beginning so does the supreme court order materialize actually no even in many states endosulfan is being sold in the markets at discounted prices so supreme court has to again intervene and compel the indian government to ban this pesticide completely and if you know anyone in your area or any of the farmers who use endosulfan educate them about the harmful effects of endosulfan so that they and their family are not exposed to it we can do this as a responsible citizen so these are few of the facts that you have to know about endosulfan with these points in mind let us get to the next discussion so our last discussion is going to be based on this news article it talks about a report of who and unicef see the name of the report is global report on assistive technology so before seeing some major findings of the report let us see what is assistive technology see it is an umbrella term for assistive products and their related systems and services such assistive technology enables and promotes the inclusion participation and engagement of certain sections of people into the community family and society they are included in the political economic and social spheres here we are talking about the persons with disabilities aging population and people living with chronic conditions because they all need the assistive technology so now what are the assistive products see these are the physical products such as wheelchairs spectacles hearing aids prosthesis orthoses walking devices or it could also include any digital or software products that help in communication time management monitoring or it also includes the adaptations to the physical environment like portable ramps or grab rails 
all these are assistive products all these help the people in need to enhance their performance in all key functional domains such as cognition communication hearing mobility self care and vision so assistive technology majorly helps people with disabilities aging populations and people who are living with chronic conditions and these are some of the major benefits of assistive technology at different levels now the report we are talking about that is the global report on assistive technology is the first such report that was launched yesterday that is on may 16th it is launched by who in collaboration with unicef now this report shares evidence based best practices and examples it also shares 10 key actionable recommendations on improving access to assistive technology for every child so majorly what are the objectives of this report first objective is to highlight the current need demand and supply of assistive technology it also aims to outline good practices for innovation and third objective is to provide recommendations to improve access so in this regard before seeing some major findings let us see few statistics related to the people with disabilities in india See according to the 2011 census the national estimate of the number of people with disabilities was 2.21 percentage of the total population that is around 26.8 million persons were having disabilities and this included persons with visual disability hearing speech locomotor and mental disabilities and uh, majority of them were in the age group of 19 to 59 and the census also noted that out of these people with uh, disabilities 49 percentage were literate 34 percentage were employed and 75 percentage lived in rural areas and it is also to be noted that india's disabled population increased by 22.4 percentage in a decade so through this you can understand the need for assistive devices or assistive products and technology for people with disabilities along with the aging population and people having chronic illness so there are three major findings of this report according to the report the number of people in need of one or more assistive products is likely to rise to 3.5 billion and this will happen by the year 2050 and this will happen due to the increase in aging population and the prevalence of non communicable diseases rising across the world another finding was affordability of assistive devices is a major barrier in accessing the assistive devices so the report concluded that assistive aids remain inaccessible for billions who need them in particular people who are in low income countries and middle income countries have very low access to assistive technologies so these were the important findings and based on this the report has given 10 recommendations it includes ensuring that assistive products are safe effective and affordable then increasing public awareness garnering public support and political support and then combating stigma around assistive technology use then investing in research innovation it also recommends for providing technical and economic assistance through international cooperation so these are some 10 recommendations i have given you here you can just go through it see these kinds of report will help you in your uh, main sansa writing particularly it will help you in your essay paper also if there is any topic regarding disability or regarding helping the aging population so you can use data from such reports to substantiate your answer with these points in mind let us move on to the next session of practice questions discussion let us take up this first question which of the following items are fortified in india the options given are wheat flour vegetable oil rice salt milk now during the discussion we saw about rice so what about other products actually all are fortified in india here you can see that rice is fortified with iron folic acid vitamin b12 zinc vitamin a vitamin b1 vitamin b2 vitamin b6 etc and vegetable oil is fortified with vitamin a and vitamin d and uh, in india salt is fortified with iodine and iron and milk is fortified with vitamin a and vitamin d so what about wheat then it is also fortified actually the whole wheat along with maida that is a refined wheat flour both are fortified with iron folic acid vitamin b12 vitamin a zinc etc so you can just go through this list and just know that what are all the micronutrients fortified in these items so if you look at the question the options given are 1 2 and 3 only 3 only then 3 4 and 5 only and d all of the above so the correct answer is option d all of the above now let us take up the next question it is about endosulfan it is a two statement question 
First statement is endosulfan is an organochlorin pesticide. Actually, this statement is correct. So you may think that because the name is endosulfan, it only has sulfates. It is not so. The chemical composition of endosulfan also contains chlorine. That is why it is called as organochlorin substance. The chemical formula of endosulfan is C9H6Cl6O3S. Now let us take up the second statement. It is banned only in India because of the health disorders caused by the high usage of endosulfan. This statement is wrong. See, it is banned in many countries and some countries are facing out the usage of this pesticide. But India is not one among them. See, India agreed to a global census to ban endosulfan. But India has not implemented it yet. Only two states in our country have implemented this. Uh, it is Kerala and Karnataka. So, statement 2 is incorrect. And here the question asks for the correct statements. So, the correct answer to this question is option A, one only. Now, let us take up this next question. Geotagging can be effectively used in which of the following? Options given are location specific advertisement, improving the efficiency of welfare schemes, social media, infrastructure projects. Now, during discussion, we saw that geotagging can be used for infrastructure projects and welfare schemes like Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, MG Narega scheme, etc. So, we can say that 2 and 4 should be in the answer. Now, geotagging is also used for tagging photos and videos in social media like uh, Facebook, Instagram, etc. So, 3 should also be in the answer. Then what about location-specific advertisement? See, location-based advertisement means creating highly customized and targeted marketing efforts that are tailored to consumers in a specific place. And uh, geotagging is effectively used in this type of advertising. So one should also be in the answer. And that is why the correct answer should include all 1, 2, 3 and 4 which is in option A. So correct answer is option A. Now, this is the quiz question for you today. Go through the question, read the statements carefully and then you can write the correct answer in the comment section. I'll tell you whether your answer is right or not. Along with this quiz question, I also have two practice questions in the mains format. You can try to answer these questions and post the answer in the comment section. So, I hope today's session was informative. If you like this video, click the like button and also subscribe to the channel plus press the bell icon to receive regular updates. Thank you.